In this video, I'm going to talk about the quantile regression and compare it with the regular linear regression and talk about in which cases quantile regression can be useful. So let's start. Um, here's just a brief outline of the presentation. First, there will be some background and explanation of the traditional linear regression method. Then I will talk about the OLS assumptions and the need for understanding different quantiles in specific situations, such as in public policy. Then I will talk about, so what is quantile regression, definition, main idea, quantiles and quantile functions, and then the mathematical foundations for quantile regressions, the representation of the model assumptions and optimization, and then there will be a practical demonstration. So a simulation of quantile regression and interpretation of the results. So a bit of background on traditional regression in ordinary least squares. Our objective is to minimize the sum of squared differences between observed and predicted values. So we're minimizing this difference, actual y minus predicted y, and this is squared, and we take a sum of that. So in OLS, we're assuming that our variable y is a linear combination of the independent variables. It's linear in the coefficients, and it's a summation, and there's also this uh, random noise. And what we're doing is we're modeling the expected conditional mean. So it's expectation of y given x here. And that is linear in the coefficients. And basically, yeah, it's a linear summation. And for the OLS estimator, the beta vector, the solution can be achieved analytically. So yeah, it depends on the covariance matrix. It's inverse and the x transpose y. So this is the most basic regression and it has some limitations. Uh, it provides insights only on the mean response conditional on x. It's sensitive to outliers, which can skew the predictions of the coefficient estimates. It also assumes constant variance of the error terms, so that's homoscedasticity. Uh, so why would we bother with quantile regression? Why is that of interest? Well, sometimes we actually have a need for quantile insights. For example, real-world data often has varying behavior at different quantiles and for policy and decision making. Understanding the tails, so the upper and lower quantiles can be very important. For example, if we have an income distribution, knowing the mean income is useful, but we might be more interested in understanding the income at the 10th or the 90th percentile, and that could provide us greater insights into inequality. Let's talk about the assumptions of the ordinary least squares. So the first assumption is linearity. Uh, the relationship between predictors and response is linear independence. Observations are independent of each other, homoscedasticity, so constant variance of the errors, uh, no multicollinearity, predictors are not highly correlated, uh, normality, errors are normally distributed. And let's focus on homoscedasticity here. It refers to the assumption that the variance of the errors is constant across all levels of the independent variables. If this assumption is violated, so if there's heteroscedasticity, it can lead to inefficient OLS estimators even though they will remain unbiased. But the issue is that the standard errors of the estimates can be wrong, leading to incorrect inferences about the significance of the predictors. So its real world implication would be in many real world scenarios, the spread or variability of the dependent variable may increase or decrease as the value of the independent variable changes. So for instance, in predicting income based on age, variability on income might increase as the age increases because older individuals could have a wider range of job roles, years of experience or education levels. So if here's kidasticity is present and not addressed, it could lead to misleading results, such as underestimating or overestimating the significance of predictors. So this is just a visualization here. The scatter plot represents an example of heteroscedasticity. So we can see plotting y versus x, the variance of the variable y increases as x increases. Uh, so there's also a OLS line plotted here and the OLS estimates will remain unbiased, but they will no longer be efficient. So there could be other linear unbiased estimators with smaller variance. And also when the variance of the dependent variable is high for specific ranges of the independent variable, it reduces the predictive power of the model within that range. Uh, we will also have a misleading R squared. So while R squared measures the proportion of variability in the dependent variable explained by the independent variables, uh, heteroscedasticity can make this measure actually misleading. 
So how can quantile regression help us in this case when the homoskedasticity assumption is violated? Well, here, let's start with an overview of quantile regression. Definition is that it estimates the conditional median or other quantiles of the dependent variable. It goes beyond the mean response modeled by traditional OLS regression. What are the advantages? It's robust to outliers, uh, especially when modeling the median. So it's more robust to outliers than OLS regression. It handles heteroskedasticity. That's our main focus. There is no assumption of homoskedasticity, making it suitable for data with non-constant variance. Uh, it's flexibility in assumptions. It doesn't require errors to be normally distributed and the comprehensive view. So it allows exploration of the effect of predictors at different parts of the distribution because we can model different quantiles. We're not just modeling the expected conditional mean of the variable y conditional on x. Uh, what are the applications? Well, it's useful when relationships vary across the distribution of the data and it provides tailored insights for policy and decision making, especially for specific subgroups in a population. What are quantiles and quantile functions? Well, a quantile for a given random variable y, it's tau's quantile, is the value q tau so that the probability of y being less than or equal to q tau will equal tau. So tau is a value between 0 and 1. The tau's quantile denoted by q tau is a specific value that divides the data such that the proportion tau of the data points are less than or equal to q tau. So tau represents the probability that a randomly selected data point from y will be less than or equal to the tau's quantile. And the quantile function, it just it defines the smallest value of y for which the cumulative probability is at least tau. So let's go now to quantile regression. In quantile regression for a given tau, we estimate the tau's quantile of y given x. Uh, and this may look similar to OLS, but again, we are estimating for a specific tau's quantile. We are not looking at the expected conditional mean. So unlike OLS regression, which minimizes the sum of squared residuals, the quantile regression minimizes a check function. And this is the check function. So u are the residuals. And here we have an indicator function. It takes the value one when the condition inside the parenthesis is true and zero otherwise. So if we look at that loss function, we are minimizing the residuals, which is the value here in the brackets, but they're weighted residuals where the weights are determined by the above check function. So the resulted fitted line has the property that a proportion tau of the data points lie below it and a proportion y minus tau lie above it. Next, let's talk about the assumptions of the quantile regressions. So some of that are similar to the OLS regression and some are not. Uh, there's linearity in parameters. So the relationship between the predictors and the conditional quantiles is linear. And that is similar to the OLS assumption of linearity. And again, independence. So the observations are independent of each other, which is the same in OLS. No perfect multilinearity. The predictor variables are not perfectly correlated. Same as in OLS. Heteroskedasticity. So unlike OLS, quantile regressions makes no assumption about the variance of the errors being constant. No indigeneity. Uh, the error term should not be correlated with the predictor variables. If it is, then the estimates of the coefficients may be biased, and this is the same assumption as in OLS. Rank condition. For identification, the model must satisfy the rank condition. This essentially means that there is enough variation in the predictors to identify the quantile regression coefficients. And outliers? Well, quantile regression is more robust to outliers than OLS, and this is especially true when modeling the median when tau equals 0 .5, 0 0.5. So how do we solve for the actual coefficients? Well, as I mentioned, we are minimizing the sum of weighted errors. Here we have y minus x transpose beta. Those are the residuals. And there is a check function which basically creates the weight for each residual. So we're minimizing the sum of weighted residuals and the objective is to find the beta vector that gives the smallest sum. In other words, the beta vector that makes our predictions most aligned with the target quantile according to the check function loss. How to solve for those beta coefficients? Well, in quantile regression, we don't do this analytically as we do it in OLS. We do it through linear programming. A quantile regression can be formulated as a linear programming problem. The linear programming approach breaks down the objective function into two parts, one for positive residuals and one for negative residuals. So then we solve for the coefficients that minimize the weighted sum of these two parts. A quantile regression coefficients represent the change in the spe specified quantile of the response variable for a one unit change in the predictor. 
So it's similar to RLS regression where we have the coefficient represents how a change in the unit of x it gives a change in y. Like that is what the coefficient represents in RLS. Uh, then I also want to mention something about asymptotic normality. So asymptotic normality, it means that as the size sample size approaches infinity, the sampling distribution of an estimated converges to a normal distribution. This is regardless of the distribution of the underlying population. For OLS coefficient estimates, OLS coefficient estimates are asymptotically normally distributed as the sample size grows, provided that the standard assumptions of OLS, including normally distributed errors, are met. And for quantile regression coefficient estimates, while the quantile regression coefficient estimates are also asymptotically normally distributed as the sample size grows under regularity conditions. However, this result doesn't hinge on the assumption of normality of normally distributed errors. An overview of linear programming for solving for the quantile regression coefficients. So we have our check function where we have the residuals here and we have the indicator function which it's one if you and it's negative and zero otherwise. And as I mentioned, we have the objective function where we want to minimize the sum of the errors over all observations and these errors are weighted. So we can form this in terms of linear programming. The optimization problem can be expressed as this following summation. So as you can see, this is a weighted summation because we have the positive part of the residuals is weighted by tau and the negative part of the residuals is weighted by one minus tau. And we want to minimize this with respect to the beta vector. And some of the linear programming techniques that are usually used are the simplex method or interior point methods or the barrier methods. And that is how we derive our coefficient estimates. Uh, so here is a simple example of when we would use a quantile regression. I generated some simple data we have an x vector, we have 800 data points, and then I generated a y vector. Uh, so it varies more as x increases. So I just converted that to a data frame and plotted a scatter plot. I plotted y versus x, and we can see that the variance of y is lower when x is lower, and then the variance grows. So you can see in the plot, the values are more distributed across y for a larger x. So this clearly shows that we don't have constant variance of y. Uh, then I just drew an OLS line and we can see that for lower x, the actual observations are closer to the OLS line and then they're further away, there's more variation. So that will mean when we would calculate the residuals, they would not have constant variance. So their variance would depend on X, and that means the homoscedasticity assumption is violated because that assumes constant variance of the residuals. Uh, so this is just the model summary. We can see that the coefficient estimate is positive and it's statistically significant. The p-value is very small, but since our assumption of homoscedasticity is violated, uh, the coefficient estimate remains unbiased, but then our actually standard error can be misleading and then the p-value would be incorrect. So we couldn't actually conclude that it's statistically significant because we're not sure due to this violation of the OLS assumption. Okay, so let's just check for heteroscedasticity using the bruch pagan test. And we can do this using the stats model function in Python. And we get the results for the LM statistic, LM test p-value, the F statistic, the F test p-value. So what do our results indicate? Uh, the significance of the test. So both the LM test and the F test have extremely low p-values. And the null hypothesis of homoscedasticity therefore can be rejected in favor of the alternative hypothesis, presence of heteroscedasticity. So the results suggest that there is statistically significant heteroscedasticity in the model residuals. And therefore the variance of the errors is not constant across all levels of the independent variables. Uh, what are the implications of that? Well, as I mentioned, that means the standard errors derived from such a model may be biased, leading to unreliable inference, so unreliable confidence intervals and unreliable hypothesis tests. Uh, so next, I performed actually quantile regression instead of the OLS regression for quantiles 0 0.1, 0 0.5, which is the median, and 0.9. And here I plotted the various uh, results for the quantile model lines here. This is for the tens quantile, the median, and the 90s quantile. And then we can just take a look at our coefficient estimates. So in OLS, 
as I mentioned, like this is for the expected conditional mean, right? So we had a positive coefficient of 9.9, .9, and we could compare that to when we're modeling the median in quantile regression. So we have here an intercept, which is actually lower than when we're using regular OLS for the conditional mean, uh, but the slope, so the coefficient estimate, is a bit higher than what we got in the OLS coefficient estimate. But again, yeah, here we're modeling the median, and this is the expected conditional mean, while this is the conditional median conditional on x. Yep, so this concludes the presentation on quantile regression, and hopefully that was useful in regards to in which cases it can be helpful and how it can be used.